society only works when free speech is there. It only grows, it only flourishes when free speech is there. And so when you start to chip away at free speech, you're kind of starting to chip away at society itself. You're listening to episode 45 of the National Secular Society podcast, produced by Emma Park. The Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill has just been approved by the Scottish Parliament and has now only to receive royal assent before it comes into law. The Hate Crime Bill, as it is known, has been one of the most controversial in Holyrood's brief history. Part two of the bill will create a series of new offences of stirring up hatred against certain groups of people identified by a list of protected characteristics, including religion. Opponents of the bill, including the National Secular Society, have worked hard to ensure that it was properly scrutinised and amendments were made in order to protect free speech. In particular, thanks to the work of the NSS and others, the bill now includes Clause 9A, which provides an additional protection for freedom of speech about religion on the face of the bill. The bill also abolishes the common law offence of blasphemy, a move for which the NSS has long been campaigning. However, there is arguably still a serious risk that the creation of new stirring up offences will exert a chilling effect over free speech in Scotland. In this episode, I discuss the bill with two different speakers. My first guest, Liam Kerr, is Conservative MSP for North East Scotland and the Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Justice. He was on the Justice Committee that scrutinised the bill during its passage through Parliament. My second guest, Jamie Gillis, is a spokesman for Free to Disagree. This is a coalition of organisations opposed to the bill, including, among others, the National Secular Society, the Christian Institute, the Peter Tatchell Foundation, the Network of Sikh Organisations and the Index on Censorship. I'm joined now by Liam Kerr, MSP. Liam was on the Justice Committee that examined the bill as it passed through the Scottish Parliament. Liam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. First of all, what were the reasons why this bill was introduced in the first place? Well, from my understanding of it, because remember, I'm the opposition here, uh, but the Scottish government decided that uh, it wanted to basically consolidate a lot of law that we have already, which is quite a crucial point that an awful lot of the protections that this bill seeks to bring in are in place already. But my understanding is the Scottish government looked to consolidate existing legislation. It wanted to abolish the offence of blasphemy. So we have a common law offence of blasphemy in Scotland, which this bill will take away. Uh, But it also wanted to introduce uh, what I will refer to as part two, which was uh, to to prescribe certain stirring up offences, the stirring up of hate. And it sought to do all of this in a bill which, quite crucially, it called the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill. And as we'll perhaps see later, the public order bit seems to have rather been forgotten about in certain aspects of this bill. The stirring up um, of hate offences are the new offences which weren't in the law before. And we'll come on to the question of why those offences might have been necessary. But let's start with the positives. How do you think the bill improved as a result of, if if it did improve, um, as a result of scrutiny by the Justice Committee and others um, over the course of its passage through Parliament? Well, I have to say, it it has been improved dramatically uh, through the course of its passage through Parliament. When it was introduced uh, round about last April, it was it swiftly became the single most controversial bill in the history of the devolved Scottish Parliament. So, in the in the last twenty one years or so, uh, and I say that because it, there were over two thousand responses to the consultation that the Scottish government always does when it introduces a bill, uh, and it's not surprising. Because what was originally in the bill really, from my perspective, was terrifying in some of the things that it sought to proscribe. Now, during the passage of this bill, there, there were I called a debate back in, in the autumn in which I said, look, we've got very little time left. We are in the middle of a pandemic. The parliament is operating at very much reduced capacity. And we have to hear the views of Civic Scotland as to the nature of this bill. Uh, The Parliament wasn't with me on that. Scottish Conservatives were with me, obviously, but uh, the rest of the Parliament wasn't, so we had to go through with this process. So it was a very tight process. 
we heard some excellent evidence from very many witnesses. I mean, it, in some ways, it showed the best of the Scottish Parliament just how well uh, we were able to take evidence and, and how uh, erudite and persuasive many witnesses were. What we've come out with uh, from stage two, which happened earlier this year, which is where you get really get into the amending of a bill, is, for example, we managed to introduce, or Parliament managed to introduce, a reasonableness test, a reasonable person test. The stirring up offences became intent only. We managed to remove some of the really most terrifying areas, I thought, in terms of you could be arrested for stirring up in your production of plays, uh, in your possession of inflammatory material. Uh, so in that sense, we made some really serious improvements to it. However, as I said yesterday in the final debate, it came in as a fundamentally flawed bill and it remains fundamentally flawed in what has been passed. Well, let, let's look at the bill now in a bit more detail. So I've just got it here in front of me. So we're looking at um, part two of the bill, um, which is section three onwards, the offences of stirring up hatred. Now, there, there are two different categories of stirring up hatred. One is stirring up hatred against race, colour, nationality um, and ethnic or national origins, which is, has a slightly higher test. But um, if we look at the second type of offence, this is when you stir up hatred against a group of persons based on characteristics specifically mentioned, which are age, disability, religion or perceived religious affiliation, sexual orientation, transgender identity and variations in sexual characteristics. And for this, as, as you said, Liam, um, what the, um, the passage of the committee managed to achieve was to say that you have to have intention to stir up hatred against this group. Whereas for the, the racial offence, you don't actually have to have in the intention to stir up hatred. Um, why is it important that, that there should be this element of intention in this offence? Uh, well, what the evidence was saying to the committee uh, was that it, it would be too easy to be arrested, to be considered to have stirred up hatred uh, on the original drafting of the bill. And that actually what we needed to do was qualify this so that, at least in theory, and we'll come on to protections for freedom of expression, I've no doubt, later on, uh, but at least in theory, you would have to have the intent to stir up hatred uh, were you to have committed the crime. And I think that's, of itself, that does raise the bar, that does raise a threshold for committing a stirring up offence. So that was very important to get in there. Has it gone far enough? No, I don't think it has, uh, but we'll no doubt discuss that shortly. But if it's stirring up hatred against a group, is there any requirement that the group needs to be present when the offence is committed? Well, I think that goes towards uh, this dwelling defence that I looked to uh, amend in to the legislation. Uh, because, so, so what I tried to do was to say, look, by all means, bring in a stirring up offence. If that's where the government wants to go, they are the government, that's their prerogative. But at the moment, in the Act, or in the bill, there is no dwelling defence. There is no respect for privacy and family life defence. So I've tried to amend that in on several occasions, which basically picks up on this public order element of the bill. So what I tried to say at stage two, so the first amending stage, was, look, if there is no public element to what's going on, then you shouldn't be in the frame for committing a criminal offence. So if I commit this uh, alleged offence in, in the safety of my own home, that shouldn't pose me a problem. Now, the Cabinet Secretary's response to that was that, that it doesn't necessarily stack up because I could invite a whole load of people into my home, stir them up to hatred, and out they go and commit some nefarious acts. They obviously get arrested. They obviously uh, have done the wrong thing. But because of the dwelling defence, I, the stirrer, wouldn't have be, uh, wouldn't be in the frame. So I said, well, okay, if that's your concern, then I will bring back some different amendments. And so myself and my colleague Adam Tompkins, MSP, put forward 
these respect to privacy and family life amendments to try and get them into the final bill. So Adam Tompkins amendment tried to say, well, look, if there's no public element to this, then it shouldn't constitute an offence. Parliament wasn't with him on that. And so that didn't go through. I offered two solutions to this. And I said, look, if I do something in my house, uh, but the only people present are my family, or let's say my flatmates, plus one other person who is not part of my family or a flatmate, then there is no offence committed. Uh, Parliament wasn't with me on that and voted that down. So I then gave them an alternative and said, look, if I am in my house, uh, I'm round the dinner table uh, and I say something hateful, I stir up hatred in front of my family, but it's only in my house, no one else hears it, it never gets out of my house, then I shouldn't be liable for an offence. And again, Parliament wasn't with me. So right now, there is no dwelling defence in this bill that was passed yesterday. And where I think that gets you to is that, let's run an example that says, we're all around the dinner table. My uncle says something pretty unpleasant uh, around the dinner table. Uh, somebody decides to report him, uh, or perhaps uh, my kid goes to school, says something in a playground, it's overheard uh, and it is reported. Then logically, the police need to investigate that if a hate crime might have been committed uh, and they start the process. Presumably they come to my house uh, and they need to take witness statements from those who heard the hate speech. Now that could be my kid, uh, uh, but that is the evidence that presumably they're going to have to take because there is no dwelling defence in this bill which is about to become an act, uh, which I think is very dangerous indeed. And, and the bill specifically provides for the for the powers of entry if if there's some reasonable grounds for um, suspecting that an offence has been committed. That's correct. Mm. So, in in other words, this looks to be an extremely um, egregious um, sort of in, interference with the right to private and family life. Is it even compatible with the right to private and family life in the ECHR? Well, I think that's a very good question, uh, and, and goes towards what happens next. Uh, I mean, I, I think there are a number of options as to what happens next, but one of those might be that there's some kind of legal challenge to this. Is it also going to be harsh on citizens insofar as that we think of a tyrannical or arbitrary law as one in which citizens don't know whether or not what they're doing constitutes breaking the law? Is it the case that a law should be sufficiently clear so that citizens know whether or not they're committing a criminal offence? Absolutely. Absolutely. And th th this, I think, goes to the core of the problem, because even after all we've done uh, to try and make this bill work, uh, we still needed to put in to try and give some comfort, to try and give some clarity, a freedom of expression clause to say, well, OK, there are certain things that you can say. Let So to try and say to people, look, let's be under no illusions. There are things uh, where you are. It is appropriate to, to maintain freedom of expression. But I actually think that what's going to happen here is that we will end up in a situation where people are almost uh, self-policing. There, there is a chilling effect on freedom of expression, if you like, because the, the, the bill itself proscribes what people can and can't say. The freedom of expression clause then comes in to give people some comfort, but there are many voices who are saying things like, look, the, the, the form and structure of that freedom of expression clause could give difficulties in terms of interpretation. It could give difficulties in terms of precedent. Uh, we had the Law Society, the Law Society of Scotland, who sent in a briefing note, as many organisations do during these debates, uh, to say, look, the, even though this freedom of expression clause, which historically during this process has been very challenging, uh, even though we've got to something now, that clause is not going to be as easily understood. It lacks clarity and it sends out confusing messages. Fundamentally, could, could it be said that this legislation is really just about sending a message to certain minorities and, and minorities, not um, majorities or, or an equally balanced number such such as women and men are is is it just about sending a message to certain minorities within Scotland that um, abusive speech against them is no longer acceptable 
Well, well, certainly the Cabinet Secretary said that several times, that, the, that there is a large part of this legislation which is about sending a message. Uh, so going right back to the question that you posed at the start, what, it, what is this bill about? I mean, part of it is definitely about consolidation, as we said. Part of it is about removing this uh, blasphemy offence. But there is unquestionably, according to representations that were made in the chamber yesterday, this element of sending a message. So yes, that is part of it. What I would argue is that by all means send a message. Uh, I think there's some debate about whether that is the function of the law, but nevertheless, if, if that is what this law is for, that's fine, but it has to work. It is no good sending a message to people that uh, you are going to be protected, uh, your rights are going to be upheld, if actually in practice the law that you've passed might not achieve that. Is there a danger that in this law, certain groups who find something offensive that other people say will use this law as a way of suppressing their freedom of speech? Well, that was certainly an argument that was made by uh, a number of stakeholders who, who came forward to the committee and said, look, actually, what we risk here, uh, and this, this was Roddy Dunlop QC's point, the, the, when, he, when he talked about the weaponization, there, there is a risk that people will report things as crimes, as hate crimes, uh, that may or may not be uh, in practice, but the, the reason that they're being reported as such might be to, to kind of suppress, to, to, to make people self-police and to, to not speak quite as freely as they might otherwise have done. Uh, and, and I think that is a risk. Uh, I go back to the point I made about this chilling effect. I think that the risk here is we end up in a situation where people are saying, look, if I've got this wrong, if I uh, write down something uh, that's pretty challenging, that is more than mere discussion or criticism, it's, it's pretty robust debate, uh, I may have committed a hate crime. And if I have, do I really want to risk being taken through the court system? Uh, I may be innocent at the end of that. I may not have committed a hate crime, but I've been taken through this whole system uh, to prove that. And doubtless you'll have a stigma attached to you. Well, yeah. well, well precisely. Precisely. I think there is that risk of, uh, of a stigma being attached, at least certainly while that process is ongoing. Liam Kerr, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. I'm joined now by Jamie Gillis, spokesman at Free to Disagree. Free to Disagree has been supported by a wide variety of groups, including the National Secular Society, the Network of Sikh Organisations, the Peter Tatchell Foundation and others. And they've all come together on this issue of contesting the hate crime bill. Jamie Gillis, hello. Good morning. First of all, why has your campaign been joined by such a wide variety of different organisations? Yes, it's, uh, it's not something you see uh, very often in society today, I think. Um, but essentially, I think these groups have come together, uh, despite their many differences and ideological disagreements, because they uh, support the right to freedom of speech and expression. Uh, they believe that these rights are uh, fundamental democratic rights, which must be supported and protected in society. And uh, they recognise that um, people can profoundly disagree with one another, and indeed should, um, and they should be able to do that. And uh, undermining free speech will not affect only one's own position, but also uh, others with whom they disagree with. And so there should be a, a mutual standing up together uh, in defence of free speech. Free to disagree. Your campaign was set up specifically to campaign against the creation of the stirring up hatred offences um, under the hate crime bill. Yeah, that's true. So the, the stirring up hatred offences uh, are the sort of controversial aspect of the hate crime bill. The bill uh, does a couple of things. Firstly, it consolidates existing hate crime laws. That's something that's not controversial. But part two of the bill, the stirring up offences, would extend uh, the stirring up hatred offences in Scotland, which currently only apply to race, uh, to include all sorts of other characteristics like age, disability, uh, religion, sexual orientation and transgender identity. And whilst that, that might sound sort of laudable on the face of it, uh, and of course we do uh, oppose hatred and prejudice, the offences are also going to cover and, and capture all sorts of speech uh, on uh, related to these many characteristics. So speech uh, relating to religion, uh, relating to transgender identity and 
and other issues which are very uh, hotly contested in society. So the concern is that actually uh, speech on these issues will be uh, reported uh, and perhaps investigated by the police, uh, or at the very least, uh, there'll be a chill on speech on these kind of issues because people fear that they're going to commit an offence. Uh, that's that's the, the main concern uh, about these offences, and, and it's what saw such a huge um, backlash really against the government uh, in the first few months after the bill was published, uh, not just members of our campaign, of course, but many, many other disparate groups and individuals in Scottish society and further afield, comedians and actors and writers and playwrights, and uh, almost felt like the world and her auntie at one point was coming out against uh, these plans. Uh, so they're highly controversial offences and uh, Although there have been changes over the, the last few months, which I, I think we'll come on to discuss, um, there's certainly still a threat to freedom of speech and expression. So let's let's start then with the um, 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 the process of getting the bill through. Um, what changes has um, Free to Disagree um, and re- related campaigns managed to make to the bill? How far have you managed to make amendments that would at least give some safeguards to freedom of expression compared with um, what the bill would have been like had it gone through in its originally proposed form? Yeah, well, it's it's true to say that some very, very important changes uh, were secured early on in the process. I think the most important probably was uh, the requirement for intention on the part of an offender uh, to commit an offence, so um, what might be called mens rea uh, in legal terminology. Uh, so the bill, when first published, would have uh, criminalised uh, abusive behaviour, which was likely to stir up hatred. Uh, that was a very vague term, and uh, it would have created a very, very low threshold for offending. Um, and of course, there is uh, a lack of understanding about what the term abusive means and what the term likely means and what the term hatred uh, means ultimately. So uh, I think that's why the bill was was so deeply unpopular initially. Uh, it was largely related to this very low threshold and the, the sort of ambiguity of the language in the bill. Um, and there were more changes uh, made subsequently, which helped as well. One of the more controversial aspects of the legislation was uh, a section covering inflammatory material, which again was uh, very vaguely defined and uh, threatened to catch all sorts of books and uh, perhaps newspaper articles and things uh, which made um, controversial statements or uh, statements which could be deemed offensive to some people. Uh, And the provisions on inflammatory material were removed from the bill after a backlash, uh, which was welcome. Uh, And thirdly, uh, provisions covering theatre performances, uh, which uh, also sort of outraged the lovies, uh, and (laughs) they, they felt singled out. These were removed from the bill as well. So I think these three changes uh, were perhaps the most key changes which were made quite early on in the process, um, I think at the end of last year. And um, they've definitely improved uh, what, <laughs> what uh, a bill which was felt universally uh, to be uh, completely unacceptable uh, and made it um, perhaps uh, a little bit less of a menace to free speech than it might have been. Well, you've talked a bit about the idea that um, speech might be criminalised. I think that people who, such as um, Adam Tompkins, when he was discussing the bill um, before the Scottish Parliament, he used both the terms what what would be lawful and also what would be acceptable. And there has been this idea that in in criminalising certain forms of um, abusive or threatening speech against groups, it would send a message as to what is acceptable in Scotland. Do you think that criminalising speech is the way to send a message about what is acceptable and and is this the should this be the role of the government it's a very interesting question i, I think i should say that I've, I've been quite disappointed um personally by by Hamza Yusuf who who has uh, seemingly failed to understand the laws that already exist in Scotland i think he's implied constantly that this bill is going to provide protections uh, and entitlement to uh, minority groups which weren't there already but that's not true. Of course, abusive and threatening language is already uh, potentially criminal. Um, you can't uh, harass people. You can't be violent towards people uh, in Scottish society. And I think that's right. Um, so there's not really any evidence that these offences will improve protections. And in fact, as, as we've discussed, they might actually undermine freedom of speech and have a negative effect on social cohesion in Scotland. I think the membership of the Free to Disagree campaign would, would take different views on, on whether or not the, the hate crime approach 
generally speaking, is the right approach. Um, I think speaking in a in a personal capacity, I don't feel that the the blunt force of criminal legislation is is always <laughs> the right way to to tackle prejudice and hatred. I think there are other ways to tackle hatred and prejudice, which would go to the root of these things uh, through um, education and rehabilitation and. I think actually through promoting free speech and protecting free speech rather than narrowing it, because there's that old adage about intolerant views and, and hateful views uh, being out in the public domain and being challenged and being attacked and being torn down. And uh, it's through open and robust speech that we can actually uh, counter prejudice. There have been some quite you know significant bodies in Scotland, like court and uh, criminal justice system representatives who have said actually that more laws is not the answer here. And, uh, you know, locking people up uh, doesn't tend to address the underlying issues, which might be the source of prejudice. And uh, in some cases, it can make it worse. So I think it's it's fair to say that the, the approach being taken by the government is not universally accepted. It's um, including by victim support groups themselves. Uh, and uh, that that's another reason why um, free to disagree, we're, we're so worried really about the legislation and, and what it might do. So perhaps the idea is that if you um, suppress hatred um, or the expression of hatred, um, it's a bit like, you know, a pressure cooker, you can suppress, you can put put down the lid, uh, but the steam will build, build up inside and it, it might explode in, in different ways. I think that's that, that's fair. Um, you know, you force things underground and they fester there and, and that can uh, be made worse. I think that is that's a very liberal interpretation of free speech and probably quite a good one. Let's um, talk now about freedom of religion specifically, um, as that's an issue that concerns in particular the National Secular Society and also um, the Christian Institute. So this is, there is a particular clause which has now been inserted, um, I, which was um, clause 9A. And we've got um, pr- protection of, of discussion or criticism of other factors. And then we've got protection of freedom of expression, of, of discussion or criticism relating to or expressions of antipathy, del- dislike, ridicule or insult towards religion. Um, so it, it seems that religion has sort of extra safeguards on f- freedom of speech regarding religion compared with other characteristics. Why has this come about that religion has these extra safeguards? Well, it's interesting, actually, because that's uh, a wording that both the Christian Institute and the National Secular Society and the network of Sikh organizations all agreed was important Um, because, you know, we as Christians, as secularists, as uh, Sikhs, recognize um, that religion and beliefs uh, and ideas must be open to uh, robust uh, debate and criticism and uh, perhaps dislike and ridicule um, that's that's really what free speech looks like. And if you start to shut down and narrow the parameters of acceptable um, speech uh, on these kinds of issues, um, you know, ironically, that that's kind of what you saw with the, the blasphemy law, which which uh, this bill also repeals. Um, so it's it's interesting, I think, that Christians and secularists and and others accept the right of of other people to attack their own views, to ridicule their own views, to uh, try to tear them down. Um, and it's a, it's a mutual agreement, really, that they should be able to do that to one another. Um, and I think that's that's the correct interpretation of, of what free speech means. And so that is why it's discouraging to see that the, the other uh, remaining aspects of the free speech clause are not um, as robust as that. So you cannot speak so freely on these other um, issues which are related to other protected characteristics and that's kind of disturbing to see that that wording about religion was lifted from the Public Order Act in in England and Wales and um, that does afford greater uh, free speech protection to speech on controversial issues so we had hoped that the Scottish Government would at least mirror that uh, and and have the free speech protections in, in the legislation as good as they are in England and Wales, but they uh, chose to chart a different path. So now we have, on the one hand, um, the offence of stirring up hatred, Hmm. um, which can be on the grounds of um, religion. It can be threatening or abusive behaviour on on the grounds um, uh, against a group on the the basis of their religion. Mm -hmm. But against that, we have protection of freedom of expression, including antipathy. 
where where is the offence that that has been created? I mean, it sounds like they're they're, they're almost take, um, creating an offence and then taking it away with with the amendment. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like an exception, isn't it? Um, uh, as a Christian believer, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, Christianity is something which can uh, be attacked and ridiculed in the public sphere in a way that other beliefs can't be. I believe that actually that's wrong, not because I, I think it shouldn't be, but because other beliefs should be as well. And it, it does kind of show the mentality in the government uh, in Scotland because it says really that you can express basically hate and you know ridicule and dislike uh, uh, towards religion. But if you say that you hate um I, the kind of ideology behind transgenderism, which which thinks that people can change sex uh, or any other aspect covered by the bill, then that's not acceptable. Um, and it, I think there has to be a difference. There's a difference between protecting people uh, and protecting ideas. And, uh, you know, you cannot make ideas and beliefs and ideologies unassailable. Uh, I think that's if you do in society, that's that's creating a blasphemy law, and, and you know you do not live in a free society if you're not able to challenge beliefs openly in the most robust terms. So yeah, there, there's it's a it's a bit of an irony that which you highlight there. Perhaps that will be realised uh, as the legislation is interpreted in the courts, because I think as as some people have pointed out, it's interesting because so far I think age disability. Uh, sexual orientation, transgender identity, variations in sex characteristics. It's only discussion and criticism, but for religion, it's antipathy, dislike, ridicule uh, and insult. So in including uh, these different terms for religion, I think you, you sort of necessarily exclude the voicing of, of these kind of things for the other characteristics. So it, it creates an imbalance there. So it, it kind of assumes that if you're talking about age, you cannot express antip antipathy or dislike or ridicule. So presumably you couldn't even have, say, I don't know, a, a comedy or a satire about any of those characteristics, because that would probably be ridicule. Well, it's interesting that, yeah, I think um, the inclusion of intent and the removal of likely probably did improve the threshold for offending. Mm. But, but theoretically, if you're a comedian and uh, you make a joke which is considered to be abusive, uh, you know, that's a word which is ambiguous, and intended to uh, stir up hatred on the grounds of, I don't know, disability. And we see comedians like that. I, you know, I'm no fan of Frankie Boyle, people like him, but he makes incredibly distasteful jokes about the disabled. He, he made uh, infamously a, a very distasteful joke about um, Harvey Price, Katie Price's son. And, you know, you might ask, would he be reported? Would he be investigated for that kind of joke today? I'm not sure he would make that kind of joke today, uh, interestingly enough, because he probably would be uh, too scared of being accused of, of uh, a hate incident already. But um, yeah, it's an interesting question that, isn't it? Should comedians who are provocateurs, who are in the business of uh, you know attacking and uh, ridiculing the human condition, should they be at risk of uh, a report to the police by an audience member who feels that they have been abused and uh, that he's been encouraging hatred against whatever characteristic they hold. It'll be interesting to see the Edinburgh Fringe, I think, in the, in the next few years and see if the comedy's toned down somewhat by, by comedians there. Would it be fair to say overall you think this bill is going to have, a, you, or the fear is this bill is going to have a generally chilling effect on, on free speech in all sorts of areas in Scotland? Yes, I think that's true to say. I, I think probably because the inflammatory material provisions uh, were removed, it, it won't... Um, be so much of a concern to writers, uh, to the media uh, than it was before. But certainly, in terms of the public, I think it's going to it's going to have a chilling effect on speech. And you know, th the government will say, "Oh, there won't be many prosecutions because public order provisions south of the border don't result in many prosecutions." And that's true. I think probably there won't be hundreds of prosecutions for the stirring up of hatred. But I think the impact will be seen in reporting. Um, we live in a society where people are aware that they can shut down their ideological opponents by uh, reporting them to the police. So you're going to see reporting, um, malicious reporting and uh, investigations by the police. The police dragged into disputes um, and arguments perhaps that they uh, that should not be under their remit. And of course, that's very stressful for the individuals involved. So 
um, you're also probably going to see people self-censoring. And I think that's that's going to be very damaging. So uh, free speech is something which is under attack already. Uh, and certainly we live in a febrile culture as it stands. Um, so I don't see how this legislation is going to help that climate. Finally, let's just really go back to the basics. I mean, in your view, why is it that free speech on all of these topics is so important in our society? Well, I think free speech is it's fundamental because it helps society to grow and develop and 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 flourish. It's it's a very central um, freedom. Where if we don't have free speech, um, then we can't criticize and mean that in the academic sense of the word and, and analyze ideas and come to consensus on them. I think free speech is just, it's just such a fundamental thing. It's it's why it's in, enshrined in human rights law. Society only works when free speech is there. It only um, grows, it only flourishes when free speech is there. And so when you start to chip away at free speech, you're kind of starting to chip away at society itself. You know, you only have to look back over the last few centuries to just to see how seminal free speech, free expression, free assembly, uh, rights like these are from the Enlightenment onwards in Scotland, which was you know, a proud tradition. You've got to ask it, what positive societal changes and developments would have been made without free speech, without free expression, without a free press. Um, it's only through these things that people were able to agitate and uh, to call out um, oppression and uh, to fight for positive change. Uh, and so, you know, these 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 rights are, are fundamental to positive change in society as well. Free speech is a right which is which is fundamental. It's a right which is good for everyone in society, and perhaps uh, most particularly uh, those in society who are oppressed, those in society who are lacking representation or affirmation by uh, their political uh, superiors and. Um, who need to access these rights to fight for change and fight for for enfranch- enfranchisement. So the irony might be that um, the Scottish hate crime bill, which which intends to give minorities greater protection, might actually in the process be, be damaging the, the cause of other minorities by, by having this chilling effect on free speech. Yeah, I think that's true. Jamie Gillis, thank you very much. Thank you. This episode was produced by the National Secular Society, all rights reserved. The views expressed by contributors do not necessarily represent those of the NSS. You can access the show notes and subscriber information for this and all our episodes at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. For feedback, comments and suggestions, please email podcast at secularism.org.uk. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a positive review wherever you can. Thanks for listening and I hope you can join us next time.